Welcome to the Baptist Reformation, where we do the work of recovering the Reformation in Baptist thought. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's debate. My name is Josh Law, the moderator. Uh, no applause. Um, this evening's debate, we will be debating, does the Christian God exist and other easy topics to settle in an hour? Um, <laughs> representing um, the Casey Atheist Coalition, we have J.J. Cantrell, Joshua Stewart. Uh, representing the uh, Christian worldview, we have Josh Summer and Trey Zatlo. I'm going to give each of these gentlemen three minutes to introduce themselves, tell us a little about them, and then we will go into the program. Are there any questions before we begin? All right, let's do it. Good evening. Everybody hear this okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm JJ Cantrell. I, uh, I'm happy to help uh, participate and uh, partner with Josh on this topic. It's something that I really enjoy thinking about and discussing. I like facing the difficult questions that uh, we have to ask ourselves as we, you know, trundle through this life. I was a uh, Christian until 2008, where at a Christian university I deconverted, and uh, since then have uh, tried to expand my knowledge of philosophy and uh, logic to better understand why we believe the things we do and how we come to those conclusions. Um, yeah, so my name is Josh Stewart. I am the activism director for the Kansas City Atheist Coalition. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We try and provide a community for atheists, uh, skeptics, second feminists, all those folks. Um, we also try to provide an outlet for those people to volunteer and do uh, charitable work outside of religious communities. And then thirdly, which is more my focus, is uh, we do activism which is basically kind of debunking myths that people might believe about atheists and also um, you know, kind of explaining in more detail what we do and don't believe. Um, I grew up in a Christian household. My dad was a pastor. Um, I, uh, once I hit around 20, let's see, how old was I? Back around 2008, 2007, um, I started coming across some ideas that were very counter to what I had been brought up and was taught. Um, and was exposed to some new things that I had not really thought through um, very much. So I took it upon myself to really start to read and study and um, try and learn why I believed what I believed. And eventually, after about nine months or so of doing that, uh, my faith kind of fell apart. Um, and so at that point in time, um, I didn't really have a community of atheists around me or people I knew who believed as I did or shared my values. Um, so I've kind of spent the last latter part of my life um, seeking that out and cultivating that because when I uh, first deconverted, it was a very lonely experience being the only atheist in a group of Christians in a church. And so I do what I do mainly to try and like help other people who were in my position. And that's why I'm with KCAC to this day. So, anyway, thank you. Everybody, thanks for uh, coming out this evening. I appreciate it. Um, it's Friday night, but y'all are out here. Um, some of you probably a little bit further away from home that you would have liked to travel. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, my name is Josh Summer. I am currently a Reformed Baptist, but my my journey to to that position uh, was a rocky one and a long one. I, I grew up in the Lutheran Church. Um, I, you know, there's no substance behind it. Just kind of do this, do that. Uh, you know, here's here's your moralistic uh, lesson of the week, and uh, you know, check it off the box. Um, there's no substance behind my religious life at the time, so I fell away. Uh, especially when I was in the military, I, you know, I would I would describe myself as a as someone who who, who rejected Christianity. I might I might I culturally associate myself with Christianity, but uh, it, it just my life uh, did not match uh, my profession, and so I, I was not a believer. Uh, I came to faith in the Marine Corps uh, about two years into my tour uh, in Japan, uh, and uh, and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ then for my salvation. 
And uh, ever since then, it has been my desire to uh, to preach the gospel, but but to bring greater clarity, uh, especially as it relates to Christian theology and apologetics. Um, just because uh, <clears throat> I know it was for me, it was Christianity was misunderstood. So I knew others had misunderstood the Christian faith as well. And so it was my goal after conversion to bring more clarity uh, to the glory of God. So thanks for coming. My name is Trey Chapel. Um, I'm a resident of Kansas City. I grew up in Oakland Park. Um, and uh, my mom uh, uh, was a, a born again Christian. My father was not a believer. Um, and I had a true conversion experience when I was 20. I'm 52 now, so it's almost 50 years ago. And uh, from that, when I first became a Christian, I was in the uh, charismatic movement. Uh, and then I, Flowed from that into uh, more of a traditional uh, expression of Christianity. And, uh, did you say we're performing that? Yeah. Okay. So Josh and I go to church together. Uh, we're <laughs> good friends. And um, I, uh, I'm self-employed, so I, I work alone. I'm a dental lab technician, and so uh, I spend a lot of time on the internet. And uh, I love engaging people. I love. I'm, I'm pretty much an autodidact. I not have a lot of formal education, but I love to learn about stuff, and I love to hear other views. And I love to uh, interact with ideas, particularly of a philosophical import. I have a fascination with metaphysics and epistemology. And, uh, and I uh, very much enjoy uh, uh, engaging in kind of a colloquial or informal style of people that have different ideas. So that's why I'm, I'm very happy with the format we ended up with here tonight, because I like just uh, chit-chatting and being able to discuss these in, in a, a charitable uh, way, but hopefully uh, in a way that I can learn something and maybe hopefully be helpful something to say that's helpful for other people. So anyway, um, I'm uh, grateful that y'all came out here, and I hope that you uh, enjoy your time and uh, that we can uh, have a fruitful discussion tonight. Thank you so much. Um, just to give everyone an idea of what our format is going to be, uh, to start, both sides will get a chance to informally address the resolution. Does the Christian God exist? You will, each side will have five minutes on that topic. I will let you get to the five minute point before I will give you a warning. If you go 30 seconds over that, I will ask you to please wrap up your discussion. Um, after that, we'll go to the ABA segment. Well, each group will be given direct questions by me um, based on the resolution. Um, the questioning side will have five minutes to discuss the topic, and then the opposing side will have two minutes to respond. Um, at the end of that, we will have a 15 minute section for unstructured question and answer back and forth between the two groups and then we'll go to question and answer uh, to the audience. Are there any questions before we continue? If not, then let's go ahead and Josh Summer and Trey Jadlow, why don't you guys go ahead and take the first uh, stab at the resolution. Does the Christian God exist? Yeah, so our, our contention comes in the form of two, two separate arguments kind of leading to one conclusion in a sense. Uh, the first argument is uh, the argument from motion, and it basically assumes that change is a real feature in the world. Uh, change is the actualization of a potential. That's how I'm defining change. It's the actualization of a potential by something that's already actual. Uh, a potential must be actualized by something or someone already actual. Infinite regress is impossible, therefore God exists. So we can pull out uh, the assumptions uh, made in those premises as the discussion goes on. Uh, the second argument is called the necessary relationality argument. Um, it starts, God is not contingent upon creation to be who he is. Uh, so God's creation demonstrates his relationality. But if God is not contingent upon creation to be who he is, he is relational in virtue of his very nature. So he's necessarily relational. If God is relational in himself, then it follows he must have actual necessary relations in himself. And if God is one essence, yet has relations in himself, he is the co coherence of unity and diversity. And the only God to cohere unity and diversity, so far as we know in the history of religion, is the triune God revealed in the Christian scriptures, that is the, 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 uh, the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. So let me uh, kind of expand upon that because I have a little bit of time to kind of go over argument one and argument two. 
Uh, when I say the actuality, I'd say actualization of a potential. So um, we might think of like uh, rubber. Rubber uh, as a substance has the potential to melt. Uh, it has a potential to be pressed into particular shapes. It has the uh, potential to to uh, you know be stretched or so on and so forth. Uh, but if you have something like a rubber ball, uh, it's actual in the sense that it's actually round. It's it's actually a ball. It's it's a ball actualized. But it has the potential to be squished, melted, stretched. Uh, but the thing about it, though, is that it takes something that's already actual uh, to actualize the potentialities in the rubber ball. Um, and so the, the contention, therefore, is that this, uh, this kind of uh, actualization of potential, uh, this, this sort of uh, chain of events, um, either linearly or hierarchically, must terminate in an unactualized actualizer, a first cause or a prime mover. Uh, that, that actualized uh, creation or the universe. So, um, so that's kind of a summary of the first argument. The second one, um, if, if we get to that God via the first argument, then uh, you know, God created the universe. Um, that means that God's relational. Uh, but it also means that God's relational not in virtue of creation, but in virtue of who He is by nature. Uh, he's not dependent upon creation to be relational, and so to be relational, yet not dependent on your relationality, uh, you, you have to be relationality in and of yourself. But to be relationality in and of yourself, you must have uh, actual relations. And, uh, and so that's how we get to uh, unity and diversity in God, and the only religion that has posited a God uh, that is both one, yet subsists in multiple persons or subsistences, is the Christian uh, system of doctrine. Uh, and so that's, that would be my summary of, of the second argument as well. Cool. JJ, you All right. Does the Christian God exist? Um, so, two, three reasons. Um, first and foremost is because I don't think there's enough evidence, actually, that the Christian God exists. Right off the bat, um, I think there is an enormous vacuum of evidence that would prove that there is a God who exists, who really cares about what we think and what we do and uh, what we eat and um, who we have sex with and how and those kinds of things. And um, a God that created the, the universe. Um, and, yeah, and it's, and it's very... At this very base level, I think this absence of evidence is very much evidence of absence, though not proof, I will concede. Um, secondly, I will say that I think the Christian God does not exist because his very nature contradicts logic. You actually heard in the opening statement the um, other side mention the triune nature of God. Well, this triune nature of God is actually a contradiction in terms itself. Um, they believe that there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and that these three persons are each individually God in and of themselves. Yet, when they speak of God, or if you ask, do you believe in monotheism, they will say, yes, there is only one God. So my challenge today to them is, how many gods are there? Do you believe in three gods, or do you believe in one? And if the answer continues to be inconsistent, then the God that they are proposing is a logical contradiction in terms and cannot exist by definition. Um, number three, um, I think that the Christian God does not exist because Christianity does not look like a divinely revealed religion, but rather looks like a man-made religion. Um, whether you, if you think Christianity is divinely revealed through the Bible, which is often said to be God's word, or through Jesus, or through an ethereal presence like the Holy Spirit, you'll notice that there are inconsistencies across the board with what Christians seem to think the Holy Spirit is telling them. Um, there seems to be contradictions in the Bible in what the gospel writers are actually saying um, who Jesus was and what happened. There are interpolations, forgeries, um, and all kinds of really bad things you'd want to not have in your book if it was supposed to be perfect um, that, are, that exist in the New Testament. And my challenge on that is this looks a lot more like a religion that has been formed over hundreds and hundreds of years and is man-made rather than something that has been divinely revealed to humanity. 
Um, and just further mention of things in the Bible that seem man-made. You can see the animal sacrifices made in the Old Testament to provide a way out for sin, God commanding genocide, mandating slavery, and those types of things. Those are very like humans of that period kind of material and not like divinely revealed truths, in my opinion. I, I would hope he would all would see that and also agree. I'm going to turn it over to JJ if he has any final comments. Um, but that's where I stand with those things. Uh, to follow up on, on how Christianity looks like a man-made religion, we, we have a text that talks about a God of many qualities and properties. The Christian God is an extremely powerful God. It has a long, uh, if you read the Bible, a long history of incredibly powerful miracles. Miracles ranging from that would have witnesses of hundreds of thousands all the way to witnesses of two to four million people as in the exodus of Egypt or witnesses with everybody that was on the daytime half of the planet when God moved the sun backwards in the sky for Hezekiah. These are incredibly powerful miracles that, can, that exist in both the Old and the New Testament. And they continued after the Pentecost in this book. So there's not a clear defining line when that would stop. But it did stop. It, it stopped after we started using you know, methods of video recording and all these other peer review and, and confirmation. We don't see miracles like this anymore. And in that regard, that religion looks very much like many other religions uh, from many other cultures where when you read about God, he's an incredibly awesome, powerful being. But he's, he's strangely absent when thousands of children die every day from starvation. Thank you, Jim. All right, let's go to the um, ABA section of the program. I'll start with the atheists since we started with the Christians for the resolution. First question is the atheists. Why is there something rather than nothing? Where did life and the universe come from? I'm going to take the easy way out to give the short answer and then give the rest to JJ. But the answer is, we don't know. Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, saying I don't know is a very, very important practice. And it's a very, it's wisdom to say I don't know in questions like these. We don't have an answer for what happened before T equals zero at the Big Bang. We don't have an in-depth explanation of abiogenesis, the beginning of life. We don't know whether or not a multiverse is a real thing, or whether that multiverse is a oscillating bubble of universes. We don't know that the uh, the uh, BVG theorem, which states that time is finite, is actually completely provable. It just seems like it is at this point. We don't know a lot of these things, and it's important to remember why we should take that position. In history, there have been many times where humans have said that they know something and it's turned out to be wrong. I'll just give one quick example of that. When Newton wrote his incredible work and gave laws of motion, astronomers used these laws of motion to calculate the orbit of Mercury. And when they calculated the orbit based on the positions, they came up with a slight inaccuracy. The Perlon in Mercury's orbit was not exactly where it needed to be in the sky. Something was wrong. And it could not be Newton's laws. We knew Newton's laws. So they postulated a planet and named it Vulcan. It took a little over 200 years before they realized, and Einstein gave us general relativity, that the gravitational lensing of the sun was enough to throw off Mercury's orbit and when they calculated it using those new numbers with new data that they hadn't had for 200 years, they were able to true up their numbers with Mercury's orbit. So when, you, when we are faced with scientific questions, we have to remember that our data is incomplete. And when they are scientific questions with an amazingly deep level of incompleteness in our data set, I don't know is a very responsible way to answer these questions. Yeah, basically, these questions are huge. They have to do with beginnings, and science isn't there yet. But we're still going to look. Doesn't mean we're done. Two minute response. 
Well, that was not an answer, my friends. Um, uh, if something exists, is our contention, then something exists necessarily. <clears throat> if anything exists right now, there are only four possibilities. Either it's an illusion, either it's self-existent, either it's, or it's self-created, or it's created by something that is self-existent. We are agents of change, and being agents of change means that we're not eternal. Something cannot be and not be at the same time in the same relationship. And in order for us to be eternal when we are time-bound, we would be, need to both be and not be at the same time in the same relationship. So we know that all that we know is not, a, a, not an illusion, um, because we're the ones asking the question. If anything, if nothing else exists, even if I'm a solipsist, and I say that the entire universe is uh, an illusion, I know that I as a questioner exist, and I know that I myself am subject to change. That which subject is subject to change is dependent by existence, and uh, therefore I'm not self existent <coughs> Okay, so, so that's the, uh, I said that it's either, um, it's not an illusion, it's not self-existent, and I also know that I am not self-created, because if I created myself before I existed, I would violate the law of non-contradiction, which is the foundation for all rational inquiry. So, uh, I'm not self-created. So the only one that's left is that I was created by something that is um, self-existent, which would be God. Um, and um, to say that, uh, the answer to the question is that we simply don't know and not give an answer. It's not an answer. And I'm not trying to be rude to you guys or anything, but it's just, <laughs> it's not an answer. And I give you an answer, and it's rationally coherent. And I've been doing this for nearly a decade now, and I've not had one rebuttal, even a serious rebuttal, to that, to that argument. So I'd be very happy to, to entertain more and to discuss it more if we could. Thank you. First question for the Christians. If God is all-powerful and loving, why is there so much suffering in the world. Five minutes. Yeah, uh, I want to address one thing, and that is uh, this notion uh, of love. Um, I think uh, in, in, uh, in common terms, we, we think of God's love as something that is uh, universal, uh, something that is uh, without exception, uh, and so that produces some, some logical problems, right? Um, uh, why, why does uh, you know, God, why is He omnibenevolent in the sense that he loves everything without exception, uh, yet he's still destroying things, bringing things up, taking things down. Uh, he's bringing life. He's taking life. He's bringing about judgment. He's uh, he's uh, administering his mercy and grace. Uh, God is in the heavens and he does what he pleases. Um, so you know we know of at least one instance in the Bible where God hates something or someone, and that's in Romans nine. You can read the Psalms and the Proverbs that says God hates the wicked. Uh, so we would say God loves everyone without exception. So that's the first, uh, the first thing. The second thing is, uh, why is there so much suffering in the world? Uh, why is there so much evil? Why is there so much misfortune? Uh, we have to frame this in terms of what's, what's God's purpose in creating the world in the first place. And I think in light of the cross, in light of the gospel, you have to say from a Christian perspective, the purpose of God creating the world is, is redemption. For him to glorify himself by way of redemption. So when we ask God's purpose in creating the world, uh, we say to glorify himself. But what's the means by which he has chosen to glorify himself? And that's by way of redemption. But you don't have redemption without a fall. And you don't have redemption without things like sin and suffering and evil. And so the, you know, we might not like it. We might not like the particular states of affairs that come about because uh, God has chosen to constitute this world in such a way. That's not an argument against why God did what he did. It's not, certainly not an argument against the Christian God. At worst, we can just say we don't like it. Uh, but, but really, uh, God has a purpose in creation, and that purpose is to glorify himself by way primarily of redemption, and he does that in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we see the, the most horrifying act of wickedness at the cross, and, uh, and that act of wickedness was, was brought about uh, by humanity, uh, but we also see that God ordained it in the book of Acts. It says that God ordained that, or predestinated rather, that event to come to pass. Uh, he predestinated uh, Caesar to do what he did. He predestinated uh, uh, Pontius Pilate to do what he did, and, and Caiaphas, and so on and so forth, in order that his glory would be brought forth in the redemption of his people by way of a sacrifice that is his son. So. Uh, that's the purpose of God 
uh, from the Christian perspective, and uh, that I think would it would it would at least give an answer as to why there's suffering in the world because there was a fall, and there was a fall because there can be no redemption uh, if there isn't one, and, uh, and and so that's that's how we would answer that question. What's my time? How you have a little less than two Okay. Um, the other thing is in relation to, to God's power. Uh, so God is all-powerful. Uh, the, the question, though, is, is does God have the freedom to choose how he uh, you know, actualizes certain aspects of creation, how he, uh, how he creates, uh, what he creates for, the purpose he creates for? And you get in this notion of teleology. So God is all-powerful. Uh, he's infinite in his being. Uh, he's without limit. Uh, any limit external to himself. That's what the term infinity refers to. And so we would say that about his power as well. And so God does have the power uh, to, to wrap up the, the entirety of redemptive history right now. Uh, he had the power to do it uh, when, when Christ was on the earth. Um, he had the power to do it before then. The problem is, is the, that God doesn't want to do it that way. That's not God's will. That's not what God has decreed uh, for creation. He is determined to create a world to redeem and glorify himself through that redemption. And so, like I said, we might not like that answer, uh, but there's no nothing incoherent about it. There's nothing logically inconsistent with it. Um, it's just what God has chosen to do in his free purpose. Thank you. Would you, would you like to say anything? One second. Just say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would, would agree with Josh that um, we're not talking about logical contradiction. That's not how this particular question is formulated. Um, but if you'll notice his answers, uh, they were that God is doing things for his own glory. God is uh, doing it because he wants to. And um, it doesn't really matter what kind of suffering happens as a result. Um, God has planned this from the beginning. He could stop it. He just chooses not to. That's a little messed up. Um, I think if you take, let's take an analogy. Let's do an analogy. Um, imagine um, some sort of father's having a birthday party for some children in the neighborhood. Um, he has his son who is the birthday boy. Um, and the kids come over. They're going to go out and play in the backyard for a couple of hours while dad makes dinner, prepares the party, prepares the cake or whatever. And you can see everything that's going on in the backyard. And the backyard is full of broken down cars. There's hits dug with spikes, like the place is just a hazard, right? And that's kind of like our world is, right? Full of natural disasters, full of all these terrible things happening. And um, he sees all these kids go through all this hardship and beat each other up and do all these awful things to each other and does nothing to stop it whatsoever, even though he could. And the entire goal is for him to get his birthday party to go exactly the way he wants it to go for his son. And he brings them inside afterwards, and there's, there's some sort of maybe judgment or whatever, but basically, as long as you, you know, accept um, the birthday boy's forgiveness, everything's okay at the end. And that's just really twisted. And if you can't see how twisted and messed up that it really is, I think that's really, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about your character. That's really awful. Okay. Um, Josh, second question for the atheists. If God doesn't exist, where does morality come from? How do we know what's right and what's wrong? Five minutes. Um, I think that uh, morality has a very specific definition. And when we use the term, we use it to convey specific process. I think that morality is Super com uh, complicated definition. It's the maximal amount of well-being for the maximum number of sentient biographical entities over the maximum amount of time while minimizing the negative well-being of any individual sentient biographical entity. It's a mouthful, but it does a really good job of capturing situation after situation after situation when you're put in a, a moral dilemma and have to decide uh, you have to make a choice between what you should do, should you make this decision, will this cause harm, is the harm that you cause here going to be counterbalanced by some more well-being elsewhere. This, and, and it's a really handy definition because it allows you to use tools to measure 
how much better off you are after the decision than before. You can use tools of well-being that we can measure even neurobiologically now. And being able to measure that is what makes it objective. I don't believe that the universe makes this morality proscriptive. I don't, my definition of morality is not a proscriptive def definition. It's not legalistic. Nobody's making you be moral. Morality is just a conscious decision to maximize that well-being. If you don't do that, you don't get punished. Although there are consequences to being immoral, there is suffering, and we do avoid those, recognize that. So there's just no supernatural punishment that the universe imposes. Um, just quickly recap. Um, so JJ and I will have some differences. In philosophy, there's three schools, of, or three branches of ethics. There's applied ethics, normative ethics, and meta-ethics. Um, Meta-ethics is usually where this question is headed for the most part, and that has to do with um, like why things are, are wrong and, and, objective, and objectivity in that, um, moral realism. And I, I'm not a moral realist. I don't, I don't subscribe to moral truth. However, I do that the idea that there is moral truth, um, JJ would probably have differed with me on that. Um, but I do think that when it comes to morality um, and, and values, we choose our own individually and, and collectively. And um, that's, that's what we decide for ourselves and as a group, what is right and wrong. And that's honestly developed probably through evolution or anything else, um, and just us being a social species. Do you have both? saying that um, uh, uh, science can give us moral code, but you're assuming the thing that you need to prove by saying, we want human flourishing. That's what we're trying to uh, argue for. You're not allowed to say that existence is somehow special and that we need to uh, treat it as if it's holy. The whole question is, is how do you say, what is the reason for your saying that it's holy? So just to say, oh, I want to minimize flourishing, or minimize suffering, that's the very question that you need to answer. And so saying that science somehow can give us a moral code is just, um, uh, it's committing the fallacy of moral fallacy called potential perpetuity. It's begging the question. It's assuming the thing that you're supposed to be proving. So that doesn't work. Um, uh, and then uh, Josh said that um, uh, he's not a moral realist. And so basically, uh, he's a conventionalist, I would imagine. I don't know, maybe we can get more into that, which basically says that the whole decides what is right and what is wrong. The problem with that is that all you have is the herd mentality, might makes right. The only reason Hitler was bad was because he was weak. And, on, and if you have a situation uh, with uh, uh, conventionalism, the only person who's wrong in that system is a person who says something is wrong, because it's a consensus. Uh, okay, thank you. Motion to conditions. Is the Bible the word of God? Is it reliable? Should it take on the road? Um, yes. Uh, is the Bible the word of God? I would, I would answer yes. Of course it is. Um, is it reliable? In my opinion, it's reliable. Should it be taken literally? That depends on what you mean by literal. Um, there, there are different genres in Scripture. Uh, actually, throughout the history of the church, recognizing various genres in Scripture and the ways in which writers use particular words in Scripture has been important for interpretational purposes. One example I'll give you is, is that the, the psalmist um, and, and authors all throughout Scripture, but really the psalmist always ascribes body parts to God. Well, nobody's sitting here saying, well, God literally has an arm uh, you know, somewhere out in space or, or you know, some 
some you know physical uh, anatomical right hand by which he accomplishes his will. Uh, nobody reads the text that way, um, and so you know trying to discern what the genre of uh, of particular books in the Bible is, is is crucially important when we ask the question: Should it be taken literally? If we if we if we think of literal in terms of does it communicate truth, um, or does every part of Scripture uh, communicate truth? The answer is yes. Uh, the question then is what genre does it use or make use of to communicate that truth? Uh, some some scriptures are interpreted interpreted allegorically. Some are uh, literal, uh, historical, uh, grammatical. Uh, so you know you have Paul in Galatians three, for example, who uh, interprets uh, Sarah and Hagar uh, allegorically uh, in order to make a point, a covenantal point, uh, communicating truth about God's covenant with His people. And uh, so you have various genres in, in Scripture, all of which are communicating truth. It's just, are they all literal, uh, to be taken literally? And uh, the answer to that is, is a nuanced one. Um, is the Bible the Word of God? Well, uh, I think so. I think you can come to at least the conclusion that the Bible is certainly reliable as a historical document. And then you have to ask yourself, well, d does it, if it's generally reliable, uh, then, you know, and is it all of a sudden, you know, telling falsities about miracles and things of that nature? And I think at that point we get into a textual critical debate or discussion uh, about, you know, copyist errors, uh, you know, when certain manuscripts or apographs were actually written uh, down, things of that nature. Were there any changes made to the text? Uh, I think if you look at the Bible as a whole, you see that is actually relatively, uh, there's relatively few uh, copyist errors, and the copyist errors that we do know of are, are grammatical in nature. But, but here's the thing, we have a, a book that was written, uh, it's actually not a book, it's a, it's a composition of many different books for the Protestant canon, 66 different books that are written throughout history, about 1,500 years. And it would be my contention that uh, throughout 1,500 years, uh, these authors have maintained a coherent uh, account of God's plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, I don't see there being any contradictions. Uh, I don't see there being any uh, any uh, just you know, blind falsities or, or anything of that nature. Uh, and I think the interpretational endeavor is very nuanced, and we should pay attention to that. Um, I think lately, uh, the, the, uh, the only hermeneutic that has been uh, really imposed upon the text, the only interpretational method that's been used, is a historical grammatical one. And it's been emphasized to a point where everything must be taken in the literal sense. Uh, and uh, when, when, when you have that simplistic of a notion of textual interpretation, especially in terms of God's revelation, uh, you're bound to run into to perplexities and, and things that might raise questions. But when you realize uh, the type of literature that was circulating in the ancient Near East, the type of literature that was circulating in uh, the first century Mediterranean culture, uh, then you start to realize uh, what authors were doing when they mentioned certain things. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is a good example of this, um, where John uses a, a lot of word pictures to make a point. It's a true point, uh, but is it to be taken uh, one for one correlationally in the sense that, uh, in the sense that what he's saying is on, at face value the literal interpretation and the answer to that I think is no. We have to be nuanced in our interpretation of the Bible. And when we understand uh, where the authors are coming from and what's going on in terms of the context of God's redemptive narrative, then we can better understand how to interpret the Bible. So uh, that's just where I would go with that initially. Do you want to say anything? I think about time. Yep. That's just about time right there. Okay. Two minutes vote. <laughs> this is your will. Uh, so, uh, is the Bible the Word of God? Is it reliable? Um, I think that the Bible is reliable to a point as an ancient historical text. Um, I think we can glean historical information from it. Um, certainly, other passages, like, say Proverbs, for example, probably has a lot of good wisdom, too. I'm not saying it's completely unreliable in those senses. It's only reliable in a historical context. Um, but it is unreliable enough to appear uh, very much a man-made product. And uh, the idea of there being some sort of coherent narrative, I think, is something that is read into the text by the people reading it, um, rather than something that you could glean from the text as a whole. 
Plus, it has been assembled by people who largely believe um, in the same God and the same religion. So there would be some sort of coherency there. It's not just a, a smattering of ancient texts from across, across religions and cultures. Um, is it reliable, though? Um, we do have evidence in the New Testament of the Gospel writers um, adding two stories, um, particularly like with a theological motive in mind. Um, the thing that comes to mind in particular as an example is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem with Jesus. Um, Matthew uh, copies the original Gospel of Mark, which had that story first. He completely gets it from Mark. He, in fact, it's almost word for word. But then he um, says that this particular event happened and was a fulfillment of prophecy. And he tries to explain how it's a fulfillment of prophecy. But in the um, that he modifies the story in such a way to have it fulfill that prophecy. There's an addition to that story. And that addition um, doesn't actually line up with the prophecy or with Mark's account. It's a very, like, caught in the act sort of moment for Matthew where he, like, tries to, like, really prove something so that people will think, oh, Jesus is important, I should pay attention to him, but it's not. And we're, so we see a sort of dishonesty in the, in the, with the gospel writers that, that way. Just in that particular example, mm -hmm. this is kind of across the, the board. Um, with there being contradictions uh, and and forgeries, people wrote and said that they were Peter, the, uh, who wrote First and Second Peter, but they weren't really Peter. Um, lots of, of these things to the point where the Bible, I think, kind of falls apart as a coherent narrative and word of God. Third and final question for the atheists: How do you find objective meaning in life without a belief in God? Um, I try to discern it as best I can. As the, like I explained to you my definition of morality, and operating on that definition in that context, that helps me define the kind of world that I want to see for my children. And it helps me find satisfaction when their lives are better off because of the decisions I've made. <laughs> I get a lot of satisfaction from creating. I play a lot of music. I enjoy it. Good times. Um, and uh, this combination of, of, of self-satisfaction and service to a better world outside of that leaves me satisfied. E easily as satisfied as any moment while I was a believer. And. Um, I don't feel like when I was a believer that contributed to my satisfaction. Uh, yeah, slightly, slightly different. Um, I create meaning for myself in my own life. Um, my time with my friends and family gives me meaning. My um, I play a lot of video games with friends, and that gives me meaning. I, I make coffee for a living for a lot of people, and have a lot of relationships through that, and that gives me meaning. But all that is fairly subjective to me. I kind of decide that, feel that. Um, I don't think there's any objective meaning um, to this existence, and I just think that's the way reality is. And, you know, to me, I don't want to believe in something that's a lie uh, in order to be able to say that there's objective meaning and somehow feel better about it myself and this existence and the way the world's going. Um, I'd rather just accept reality for the way it is. From a naturalistic perspective, it's strange that uh, that meaning just seems to arise up in us and uh, we, we just generally, generally find meaning in our lives. And I think if I could ask, if I could have asked the question, uh, I would have, I would have granted, yes, unbelievers do find objective meaning in life without a belief in God. Uh, the question really is how do you how do you um, how do you account for the meaning that you do find in life? And that's that's really where the rub is. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the reason that we all find are, are able to find meaning in life, that we're able to experience things like love and uh, familial relationships, uh, when we see our children for the first time, uh, you know, something rises up in us uh, that just warms our heart. We love our kids. We love our parents. We love our families. Uh, this kind of provides some meaning to our lives. But then we have, like Josh said, we have our daily affairs. We 
We take pride and we enjoy our work. We take pride in and enjoy our work. And so, uh, you know, we find meaning in those things. We find meaning in community. We find uh, that's part of the reason why the church is so engaged in fellowship is because there's meaning to be found in the fellowship of the church. So the question is not whether or not objective meaning can be found. Uh, and uh, the, the question really is what, what, uh, what justifies or warrants that that meaning that we do find in our lives. Like what, what makes the meaning or what, what makes what we think is meaning actually meaningful? And uh, I don't think the atheistic worldview has an answer to that question. Uh, I, I will say this, that um, God has created the world in such a way uh, where meaning is, is natural to it. Uh, he, he has created the world with a particular set of, of moral duties, of responsibilities that he has put in the hearts of men. And uh, so we take pleasure in things like work. Adam was made to work in the garden. And so it's not, it, it's not uh, crazy to think that man would actually naturally likes to work and take pleasure in that. So. Thank you, Josh. Final question for the Christians. If everything needs a cause, what cause This question is a, a very oft um, question that is posed for the Christians, and it actually is a question that is uh, ill advised. Um, uh, Bertrand Russell, when he uh, wrote his book, uh, Why I'm Not a Christian, he uh, came across this argument, this realization, I think when he was 17, and he carried it throughout his entire life. Uh, and it was that problem. If everything has a cause, then what caused God? Uh, the problem is that uh, he was stating the principle of causality. <clears throat> the problem is, is that's not what the principle states. It doesn't say that everything must have a cause. It says that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Or, another way of putting it, every effect needs to have a cause. Um, and this is not something that is open to question because everything, uh, every, an effect is something that is a result of a cause, and a cause is that which gives rise to an effect. It's called an analytical statement. It's true by definition. It's like saying two plus two is four. So, um, uh, so when you're saying that um, uh, every effect must have a cause, some people like to say, uh, well, something just spontaneously came into existence. Well, you're talking about an effect without a cause. And you can't do that because you cannot define the fact other than invoking the term cause. And so uh, when you say that everything must have a cause, it's, it's simply misstating uh, the, the, uh, uh, the principle. Unfortunately, Bertrand Russell carried that mistake throughout his entire life and completely missed the point of the whole thing. And uh, you, if you want to say that something just popped into existence, I don't know if you remember, I, I gave four, four possibilities for existence. I said if something exists and something exists necessarily, and I said, it can't be that it created itself because it would need to be and not be at the same time and in the same relationship. Okay? It'd have to create itself before it is. Um, and that's what you're saying. If you're saying there's an effect that just popped into existence, some people like to refer to quantum mechanics, and they'll say, uh, on the quantum level, we see things happening. Uh, um, it was, um, who's the guy? Niels Bohr uh, uh, believed that uh, uh, that things could just pop into existence. Uh, and, uh, and Einstein said, uh, no, if he said God doesn't play dice, if he does, then I'd rather be a cobbler or work in a, a gaming house. Uh, because it's irrational what Neil Bohr said. Even on a quantum level, we may not understand how quantum particles work, but we just need to do more work. We can't say that it somehow can be and not be at the same time, same relationship. Because once you jettison the law of non-contradiction in your inquiry, it's called the principle of explosion. You, you commit the, the principle of explosion, which means that when you say that law of non-contradiction doesn't hold at any level, then it also means that the opposite of what you're saying is true as well. And uh, it's, it, there, there's no such thing as inquiry once you throw out the law of non-contradiction. But that's what uh, uh, has to happen if uh, an effect happens without a cause. So, uh, so just in closing, I would say that um, uh, everything doesn't need a cause. Every effect must have a cause. Everything that happens, everything that is subject to change, everything that came into being, I myself was born. I know I am moving, I'm being affected by other things every moment of my life. Therefore, I know that I am not self-existent. 
And if I'm dependent on my existence, then necessarily, by logical inference, there must be something on which I depend. And it cannot be something that's changing like me, because you cannot have an infinite regress of effects without causes. And therefore, there must be uh, a self-existent being that, uh, that gives us our, our existence. I just say real quick, um, sometimes uh, people say we're question begging when we exclude God from, uh, from being an effect. Uh, why doesn't the principle of causality uh, apply to God? Why are we just kind of special pleading? Uh, we're not. Uh, God, God's not defined as an effect. Throughout Christian history, uh, even to secular thinkers like Aristotle, God was not defined as an effect. Um, God is not an effect. He's necessary being. And uh, you might say, well, how do you know that? Uh, because earlier, when I, when I stated our first argument, uh, the argument basically is that uh, everything that's a mixture of actuality and potentiality is contingent uh, and is there, must therefore necessarily be grounded in uh, something that is pur or actus puris, uh, pure actuality, something that has no potentiality. And uh, so God is, uh, is necessary in virtue of being pure act. And that's, that's how we get there. Two more um, I have a comment, and I'll let JJ wrap up. Um, so a comment um, comes, comes from Daniel Bennett, actually, after hearing William Lane Craig's uh, version of the cosmological argument. <coughs> Um, and I, I think it's kind of st uh, stuck with me. It's not necessarily like um, a final say, but something just to keep in mind. And that's um, that when we're dealing with cause and effect, we're often um, dealing with that in a place where we have space and time. And we're dealing with our normal intuitions about how cause and effect, work, cause and effect works within space and time. Um, you, you, because with cause and effect, you have a before and you have an after, right? Um, when you're dealing with beginning of the universe and like God and being outside of time and space, ideas about causality really start to get fuzzy and they become very difficult to grasp. And so I'm very cautious for any argument that um, displays a sort of certainty on how causality works outside of space and time um, and using everyone's moral intuitions to try and get leverage a conclusion. Um, especially one so significant um, as a god of this nature. Um, yeah, very, I, I, I can totally understand the, the position that without being based in time, a cause is not necessary. That there is a, a logical consistency to that. I do, I struggle understanding what timeless things are. Like, if I have a million dollars in my bank account for zero seconds, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what I actually have. If, I, if, I have, if there is anything in a place with no time, how do you describe its qualities? Yeah. What kind of qualities do you, do you, can you say that this thing that is in a place of no time, it's a jealous thing, it hates some things, it loves some other things, and it really, really wants glory. But it's not actually inside time. And these are all time concepts. So it, it, it's difficult for me to just blindly accept these concepts that exist only in time can also exist timelessly. That's time, DJ. Speaking of. All right, so we're going to move on to the next part of our program. And this is a very unstructured part. It's going to allow our um, contributors to be able to ask questions for one another. My request to you is that you respect each other's time. Um, if you're going to present a question, you give your uh, counterparts an equal opportunity to answer said question. If you have a rebuttal, make sure that it's concise. The only time I will interject is if I feel like anyone is grandstanding and trying to eat up too much of the 15 minutes that we have allotted for this. To help you guys, I'm going to go ahead and mute this microphone so you guys can each have your own side. Yay. I'm going to turn up. I think this speaker is quieter than that speaker. Oh, yeah. We rigged it that way. Right. <laughs> I wanted our voices to be small. Hello, hello. Check, check, check. check. Hello. 
No, no, no. Hello? I like it. All right. <laughs> Everyone can hear, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> can I go first because my name is Josh? Oh, wait, that's not going to work here. <laughs> he goes first because he's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a quick question for Trey. I think it kicks off. Is that all right? Okay. Um, so I remember you saying um, you have to have an answer. I think it was in the first question that you were dealing with, the first rebuttal we gave. Um, you said, um, when, you know, we have to give an answer for this. So I'm curious, when, when do you say, I don't know? When is there something you come up against and you're like, I don't really know the answer to that, I'm not going to just think of one? Or do you really always think that you have to have an answer? Or is that a misunderstanding of what you were saying? No, I don't think we always have to have an understanding. Um, but when you always have an answer. Uh, well, uh, no, we don't ever have to have an answer. In fact, uh, uh, as a Christian, there are certain answers that I myself cannot answer, which go into the position of mystery when we're talking about the nature of God. For some, some, and and but I, I am very happy to admit when I don't have something. But when the answer is right there before me, and it's an analytical answer, in other words, logic leads me there, then I'm going to go with it. And if and if my opponent, who is against my view, says, "Well, I." don't have an answer, I say, check me. I mean, and I, I don't know if but I mean, that's, that's, I, I give a reliable answer that is rationally coherent, sure. and that, that follows uh, the laws of logic and our sense perception. Whenever I'm doing any kind of inquiry, I'm going to have those two presuppositions, and I think you guys would grant that, that we can have basic reliability and sense perception. Yeah, that, that honestly answers my question, that's fine. Okay. I don't think your answer is coherent, though. Okay. <laughs> Not coherent about it. The triune nature of God. It doesn't make sense on its face. That's not the answer we were. The, 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 the God we postulate is the reason. It has to have a triune No, no. I, I was not, for that particular answer, I wasn't talking about the triunity of God. I was speaking of his necessary nature. Right, but God's triune nature is, comes with that, right? Yes, but, but that's not. Part of uh, that it, it, it follows necessarily logically, but before we talk about trying nature of God, we've got to speak to the issue of existence. In other words, how do we justify contingent existence? Okay, without violating the law of non contradiction. Okay, so in other words, my God is so much more than the God of Aristotle, who is a first mover, but he also is no less. And so I start there. Okay. And then, then we so I wanted to address something with uh, what you said, you kind of, kind of bounce off the band in it uh, a little bit, dealing with space and time, causality gets fuzzy. Uh, when we go back to, to questions of, of causation, beginning, origins, things of that nature. Um, why can't we just deduce from, uh, you know, our, what we do know, uh, you know, and reason based on what we do know? And what we do know is that uh, an effect must have a cause, and that every cause produces an effect, and that infinite regress is impossible, we don't have any experience of it, there's no reason to think it's tenable. Why can't we go, why can't we conclude these things based on what we, what we do know? I mean, that seems to be the enterprise of science, right? And science is crucially concerned with questions of causality. Uh, why can't we just go based off what we do know and then conclude, um, conclude that way? Um, because we do know that the things in this physical universe that occur since the time of the Big Bang are causal. We don't know that that's true beforehand. So we have to, we, it's not the same set of rules. But we're not talking about beforehand, we're talking about, Stephen Hawking said almost everyone now agrees that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. So we're talking about the, that time forward. Right. There, if there was an effect, there must have been a cause at that moment. Before that moment, there was a universe, so it doesn't necessitate and, a cause. And there was no effect. It, it, does it does necessitate a cause. So you're, you're saying basically that the year was causing itself? I said I don't know. Okay, but why, why can't, why can't we, why would we, why would we, uh, say, basically, grant the law of causality with everything we know, and then all of a sudden exclude this little area of, of, of you know, the history of existence and say, well, 
just because it was a, 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 a strange or unique time that therefore our principles that we do know does not, they don't apply. Uh, there's no reason to think they apply. What is the reason for not thinking that they apply? Well, as I said, the BGV theorem, the, the board booth Blinken theorem, is where we get, is, is the thing that astrophysicists use to describe how time is spinning started at the Big Bang. And I believe it was Guth who said that our understanding of what happened to the universe before that point breaks down and we cannot use the processes that we use after t equals zero the way that we would, if we, we can't use them before t equals zero the same way, we don't know that that works. Well, I, I, I might understand that materially, um, but we're not just de dealing with material existence either. I mean, uh, obviously things that we can say about matter won't apply to um, a, a spaceless, timeless point. I mean, that, that's already, we're getting into fuzzy language, but it's fuzzy. Well, yeah, but, 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 but what you just, the person you just referenced, uh, you know, he says, basically, our principles break down at that point. Why? Why? Why do they break down? They're using the higher level math, the theoretical physics, that literally starts to just produce infinity as like an answer. And that is like a, a good clue that something's wrong. Right? Uh, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think okay. so. That's yeah. my understanding. Yeah, sorry. That's my understanding of how that's been, been met. Um, I mean, I, I don't understand why just because it's, it, you know, you start producing equations that seem to indicate, uh, you know, uh, some sort of existence ad infinitum uh, that, that these principles break down. Because as far as I'm concerned, the laws of logic are, are primarily mental. They're primarily mental and primarily thoughts. And if they're thoughts, they're from the mind of God. Sure. I mean, so, I, I will say, like, this is in the realm of theoretical physics we're talking about. And, like, the, the fringe of the, those disciplines. And those experts seem very cautious to, like, make any sort of conclusion beyond that. They, they give us reasons to try and help us understand those things. If you guys like think you can go beyond that and get God out of that, that's that's nice. I like I, and I think like maybe you even have a point, right, as far as like Aristotle's type type God. Um, but we are the resolution tonight is does the Christian God exist? Yeah. And so that doesn't even get us there. Yeah, let me say that. Let me say something about that real quick. I, I, I you know Trey mentioned it, alluded to it earlier. Just because we're arguing for uh, a god with a particular set of attributes that other, you know, someone like Aristotle would have argued for, doesn't mean we're not arguing for the Christian God. Uh, at, at worst, it means we're arguing for an incomplete notion of the Christian God. Um, I, I think what you get is you, you, the amazing thing is you start to see secular thinkers arrive at this particular God with the same set of attributes, and then you have Scripture. Uh, the Bible, all the way through from Genesis to Revelation, ascribes the same set of attributes to the same God. And then our necessary relationality argument that we gave as our second argument in the opening statement, it just, it, it's, just, it's, just actually, it's actually just following on the assumptions of an Aristotelian argument for the existence of God. Yeah, I, you know, I, just, I don't think all the other baggage that comes with um, that particular Christian version of God is going to fly. Um, not just the triune nature, but I mean, even things like animal sacrifices and slavery and that kind of stuff. It's very man-made. That's not, that doesn't sound like uh, something we get to through rational thought. So, with animal sacrifices, I mean, Scripture explains that in terms of typology. Um, so, those things are looking forward to something, so there's a, a redemptive purpose or quality in them. And we see that in Scripture itself. That's how Scripture explains itself, uh, especially in places like Hebrews. Uh, the book, the Epistle of the Hebrews, where it talks about the purpose of animal sacrifices. And then even be before that, uh, you even see pictures in the Old Testament uh, where authors of the Old Testament are saying things like, God does not desire the blood of bulls and goats and uh, blood of bulls and goats and rams. So th these sacrifices, the temple system, the Levitical priesthood that's instituted at Mount Sinai is looking forward to something more, uh, something better. And that's what Hebrews calls a better covenant. You even see a new covenant coming in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, where it first explicit mention of a new covenant, and even in Ezekiel 37, that something is coming, and indeed it does come in the person and the Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the scripture, scripture explains itself, and those are the, the terms by which it Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's, it's never laid out by one person coherently. It's usually like these new ideas are introduced hundreds of years later by new people adding on to the book. Where and they reinterpret stuff in, in, in 
in spite of what they have. So sacrifices, like like let's take sacrifices for example, like those are those are introduced abruptly in scripture. No, no, they were introduced early on because that's Mesopotamian culture, mm -hmm. right? They did animal sacrifices, correct? For sure, including human sacrifices. So what are you saying? It's like all of a sudden introduced. It was never. Uh, it was never. No, but this uh, like the idea where Hebrews like explains all this stuff and says. Mm -hmm. But but I'm saying that. The, the, the theology that, that the author of Hebrews is using is actually Old Old Testament, Old Covenant theology, and we see that in the Old Covenant, where the authors are saying things like, the blood of bulls and goats I have not desired, and, and things of that nature. And right. looking for the, the guy who wrote the blood of bulls and goats I do not desire. Um, like, was that multiple authors? Multiple authors. Um, are those the same authors as the people who put together the Old Testament law explicitly saying what the sacrifices were supposed to be? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. Do, so so the Exodus? In the penalty, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. That's a lot to spend on sacrifice. So Trey, you talked about when I when I talked about my my you know definition of objective morality, and, and it is very similar to here. We don't agree on a lot of stuff, but it, that same kind of structure. You said that that's not an answer because that you don't get that morality from anywhere. Did I? Is, I understand you correctly. Yes, you're assuming, let me say this, you're assuming the sanctity of existence in your moral code. Would that be correct? I, no, it would not be correct. Okay. So you're not trying to save life in your moral code? Um, I, I, rephrasing it that would be better. Okay. Yeah. All right. So is life intrinsically valuable? Um, the universe doesn't care about it. We do. And the, the Are you a part of the universe? Um, I don't represent the whole universe. Are the you universe. part of the universe? Oh, yes. So the universe, at least in part, cares about existence. Yes, but I don't think that, that means that the universe is a, a like a like pantheistic kind of thing. It's impersonal, right? Right. Are you personal? Yes. Are you part of the universe? Yes. Incredibly small fraction, yes. <laughs> okay. So the universe is personal. That's an oversimplification. Now, are you, are you? I disagree with that. Okay. The universe is not personal because one part of it is personal. Is part of the universe personal? The car is not a steering wheel. Okay, is part of the universe personal though? Some of the atoms in the universe are personal. Okay, so um, are you familiar with the principle of um, uh, proportion of causality? No. Something cannot actualize in something else that which it does not possess. For example, a rock cannot create a philosophical society. Do you agree with that? I'm not sure I understand the principle of things. Uh, it sounds like a right hand. Okay. Um, you cannot impart something to something else which you yourself do not possess. Okay. Can you impart to... Um, your children, the ability to fly, you say something like that. That might be a, a mo I'm, I'm trying to do it without doing that absurd. Sure. Take the most. That's, that's fine. I, I think I, no, my I'm, mind is occurring. I'm wanting utility to this. Yeah. Well, um, the definition of morality that I follow is something that I choose to value based on the way that humanity has evolved as a species from lower life. <laughs> and so, um, there is, you're saying that there's teleology within the humanity that has been evolved. Was that correct? I think so. I don't know if I'd use the word teleology. Des design uh, from, from the bottom up. No, from the bottom down. Goals. Are there goals in this world? No. Did you goal to say that? Mm -hmm. In a subjective sense, yeah. Not objective. Okay. So this universe contains goals. And your job is to demonstrate to me how impersonality can value personality into existence. Don't, sorry, so our job is to, our job is to value how personality can be yeah, To demonstrate. To demonstrate yeah. impersonality? Yeah, how can, in, how can unintentionality intend intentionality into existence? Uh, we've, we've been working on this for several hundred years. It started with Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's evolution has no efficient cause. It doesn't need to. This has been a process of inanimate actions and their development as part of... And it's unintentional, right? 
Right, so like uh, termites nests, for instance, can like, they can, not knowing that they're building this giant mountain in this maze underground, develop it over time through kind of behaviors. They didn't design that from, from the top down. Uh, yes, but are they, des are they desiring to do some type of goal? Um, possibly one they don't even understand or are conscious of. Well, they're trying to survive, right? Yes, because from evolutionary pressures. Okay, so there is. Yes, well, evolution does not value things. Okay, we'll leave it at that for right now. All right. Okay. Let's still move my back yeah. real quick. Thank you guys very much. Um, we're going to turn it out to all of you lovely people who have managed to come up here today. I don't have a wireless mic, so if I call on you, please just say your question as loudly as you can. If the panelists can't hear it, I will repeat it for you for them through my microphone. Please remember that a question is concise, one to two sentences. Those sentences end in a question mark. I know that everyone has a lot of opinions on this topic, but we came here to hear the opinions of our lovely panelists here. Let's respect their time by not grandstanding on them either. Who would like to start? Please raise your hand. <clears throat> My question is, you kept saying uh, he glorifies himself. Isn't that selfish for one to glorify himself? Yeah, that's a really good question. I appreciate you asking that, because that's a question that my wife and I, Christy, actually uh, wrestled with for a while. Uh, I'd say maybe about three years ago. Uh, she asked me, like, why? It, it seems prideful of God to, to want to kind of exalt himself or glorify himself. Um, the reason, I've got to start here with the creaturely level of things. The reason it's prideful for us to want to glorify ourselves is because from a biblical perspective, we're made from the dirt. I mean, Adam was brought up from the dirt. Um, we're sinners. We've fallen. We're imperfect. Uh, we're, we're, we're justly condemned by God. Uh, so it, it's, it's a fool's errand, uh, so to speak, to want to glorify oneself. But when we get to God, we see a God who is uh, the uh, infinity of his perfections. He is, he is, uh, he just is. He is uh, pure actuality, his glory is infinite. And uh, so God is not uh, prideful when he wants to glorify himself or, or if he desires to glorify himself in his creation, simply because there is no other thing that is higher than himself to glorify. Just like when God swears by himself in the Old Testament, he swears by himself because there's no other standard by which he could swear to that would be more uh, exalted than himself. Um, he, is, he is our surety. He is who we can trust in. He's a good God. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, there's just no other, there's no other person or no other thing that could be glorified or would warrant glory uh, as God does. Uh, so if there's anyone uh, who, who, who uh, rightly demands glory, um, it, is, it is God. So the answer is no. He's not selfish. Right. Okay. Joshua, would you like to comment on that question? Um, yeah, it's just that um, if it's for his own glory, that sounds like he's wanting something for himself. Um, if that's his entire purpose, it sounds pretty selfish to me. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, be right there. Um, so. From my perspective, it seems like the uh, goal of religion itself is to find a meaning to life, but I mean, why do we need even to have a deeper meaning to our existence besides the fact that we just are here? The, what I tried to touch on earlier is the fact that we, we, we do just come upon meaning, and the question is, uh, why? Uh, why, on a naturalistic uh, level of things, or in a nat naturalistic view, do we just come upon meaning in this universe? Why, why do things mean something to us? Why does family mean so much to us? Why does uh, our love have meaning? Why does it mean, uh, you know, why does, why does human life mean something to us? Why do we have justice systems and things of this nature to protect other human beings and to, uh, to, uh, to like J.J. said, to uh, provide or cultivate human flourishing? things of that nature. So the question isn't so much as to uh, whether or not, uh, yes, in a sense, religion uh, does provide a, a meaning, uh, but I wouldn't, 
say it necessarily, it, it punctuates the meaning we already find in life. So uh, apart from religion, number one, the meaning we find in life we can't account for. Uh, number two, life doesn't seem uh, as, as, in my opinion, as special as it, as it does with Christianity uh, in terms of God creating humanity. Uh, humanity wasn't owed anything. He didn't have to create us. He didn't have to redeem us from the fall. He didn't have to do anything uh, for us, yet he did in his covenant purpose. Um, I do, I want to just add real quick that I do think there is a natural explanation for me. And I, I think we find it in ourselves and elsewhere in the animal kingdom through the way that we experience serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine and adrenaline. These things cause us to have experiences that we find valuable. And they're perfectly natural and they exist and we can show that when they interact with our brain, we can show in real time using fMRIs how we light up with joy or excitement or pleasure. And we can show that when these things break, like when someone experiences amusia and can no longer hear music, they just hear sounds that sound like clanging of cymbals during symphony, we can show that those areas don't light up. There's a very natural process to enjoyment and value. In the back there? If there's a God who desires a direct relationship with us, uh, why would that God allow thousands of competing and contradictory religions in the world today? Well, I think scripture itself accounts for that. Uh, not just broadly in terms of the fall, but it itself uh, mentions other religions, other false religions, pagan religions, especially in the ancient Near East. And, uh, the foundational reason for various religions and distortions of the truth is that, as a matter of fact, in the very earliest portions of Scripture recorded in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, what we see is, is religion becoming corrupted, uh, and it's Judaistic religion that's becoming corrupted. Uh, the, the golden calf, for example, at the base of Mount Sinai, uh, was, you know, is kind of an intentional uh, representation of, of Yahweh, so it starts with man wanting to bring God down and be more like to be more like Him, uh, and then distortions of the truth happen after that point. So Scripture gives an account as to why there are different religions. Yes, as a result of the fall, there's noetic effects uh, on our on our intellects, our desires, our affections are misplaced, uh, and so we run after other gods. Um, and indeed, Scripture even the Bible even records that. So as to why. Uh, why that happens if there's a God who desires a relationship with his people. First of all, God desires a relationship with his people. And God ensures by way of his righteous decree before the foundation of the world that that relationship will take place. So God is not dependent on free, libertarianly free decisions of his people uh, to formulate a relationship with them. He, he changes them, he uh, changes their hearts, and he brings them into his covenant. Uh, so he desires a relationship with a specific people, and that relationship will definitely occur. But here's the thing, is, is God actually talks about, and Scripture mentions this in Romans 1, is that idolatry is an indication of God's judgment on an unrighteous people. So when, when, Ro when Paul talks in Romans 1 about how God gave them over to their passions, Indeed, idolatry was uh, part of that in various forms. I mean, there was sexual immorality and things of that nature that was going on. Um, but uh, at the core of that is idolatry. At the core of the first sin in the garden was idolatry. They wanted to be like God. They idolized it themselves. And so idolatry, though, is, a, is especially corporate idolatry when we see it in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is an indication that God's judgment has come upon a people. And that's how God initially begins the process of judgment. That's what we see in Scripture. Yes. Yes. Um, it's, it's difficult for me to understand that. Uh, I, the first example that came to my mind was if uh, false religions are corruptions of Judaism, how did the aboriginal religion become a corruption of Judaism? Since it was on an island long before the Hebrew people were established in Mesopotamia. Um, 
it, it's easier to explain all of these different religions if we say that they're all the same process of people adapting to an environment that they don't understand. You would see what we would expect in that case. You wouldn't see polytheism to be way more common than monotheism if monotheism theism was the phylogenic parent of all of these false religions. In, in my mind, at least, that would be where I would lean. Can I give a brief response? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, first of all, uh, if Romans 1 is true, that's exactly what we would expect as well. Um, if, if people know God by virtue of what he's created, uh, then it would make sense for people to stumble upon, as it were, uh, religions, uh, even if they're Ab Aboriginal cultures on islands estranged from civilization. It would make sense for people to stumble upon God, as it were, and then in their sin, because of the fall, all humankind is fallen, uh, to distort what they find uh, to be true from the light of nature. Uh, so I just think that's, that's, that bears witness to the truth of Scripture. Uh, you know, the heavens declare, declare the glory of God. Well, when we receive the revelation of God in nature, uh, when, we re when we see that glory of God in nature, what do we do with it? And uh, so our, our reasoning faculties as humans uh, have, have been corrupted by sin. So we, we don't do the right things with this information that we receive. That's why when you see things like Aristotle, uh, people like Aristotle coming to this uh, uh, very uh, logical uh, conclusion that God exists and then this God has a specific set of attributes, it's actually, it's actually awe-striking to see that. Um, because he gives a very coherent view of God, and he does that uh, by way of, of, of reason. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he's, he's justifying it logically, and he's reaching it deductively. And so um, I think that's, that's important as well. Thomas Aquinas uh, does that also. So. Yes, ma'am. First of all, I have a comment uh, relating to this gentleman's question. So your answer to that is because the Bible says so. To, to what? Which Why are there other religions? Why are there religions? She's oh, saying your answer is your because answer the Bible is, says so. Well, other religions are false because the Bible says so. Uh, well, I, I think there's there's uh, reasons we can give just just from from nature. I mean, this, this right here, what we're talking about this evening, uh, the, our first proof for God's existence was an Aristotelian proof for the existence of God, uh, and 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 that argument right there um, would would first of all it directly contradicts polytheism, and uh, then the uh, the uh, the necessary relationality argument, the second argument we gave this morning, directly contradicts uh, something like a, a, a monad, like a law. Um, because Allah has no relationality in himself, so how is he creating? It's incoherent to say that this God has no re necessary relations in himself, but then he decides just for no reason to become relational and, uh, and, and create this world. It just doesn't add up in the, in the final analysis. And so those two arguments are not found in the Bible. In other words, I'm not saying because the Bible says so, uh, therefore this. I gave two uh, rational arguments for the uh, existence of a particular God. And then uh, I said, if the Christian worldview is true, or if the Bible is true, that would, the, the fact that there are distortions in religion would be exactly what we would expect to see. Because it itself says there, God himself says that, that, that there are. So, because you were born in the United States, you are a Christian, and somebody who was born in the Middle East is a Muslim, that's your God prefers the people of the United States. Of course not. Uh, I, I think that, and I'm not saying this about you, but I think that objection lacks a historical perspective. Uh, the Christian religion started in the first century, uh, and it started in the Middle East, in Israel. And so the first flourishing of Christians happened elsewhere besides the United States. Uh, moreover, Religion in the United States is, is admittedly in trouble, and I would say that uh, is the case also in places like Europe. But it's flourishing over in China and in North Korea because of, of people's perception of the gospel there. So the gospel, and this is what's... Because what's Christians have gone over there. And exactly. Said, this and, is the way it is. Exactly. And that's in, in, Matthew, in Matthew 18, uh, 
in, in, in the Great Commission, uh, that's that's what we're commanded to do. So that's that's how God even said that His word would travel. So God uses means by way of by way of yes, human mouthpieces to communicate His word, and and that's His means to draw people into Himself. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah. I just think so. Like God, God is supernatural being outside of time, infinitely powerful, wants to communicate to everyone that He loves them and wants to save them, wants them to know the gospel story, and yet. Um, has to use very human beings, apparently, to get this message around um, and write books and uh, even, even, actually, the Christian religion even invented the books so it could get around better, like, in, in a sense, um, all, the, all the codexes and stuff uh, put together, um, carried around to, like, tell people what was going on. It's like, yeah, this is all, like, very, this is very, this is what you expect to see if the religion is man-made. Um, it's not divinely revealed. It's not trumpeted from the heavens. It's not given to everybody innately. It's just um, confusion and a huge game of uh, telling someone telling someone else something, someone else learning that thing from someone else, and then getting confused about it a little bit, and you see things split and weave. I mean, we're not just dealing with other religions here. Remember, we're dealing with different denominations in Christianity, almost 10,000 at this point. Um, the confusion is at the point where, like, if God is really sitting here looking at everyone and seeing all these things, you would think you would go, hey, uh, so y'all are confused, let's correct a few things. And we don't see that. It just gets worse every day. Can I have a follow-up? No, we got an individual, a new question. Uh, this is for both sides, actually. I believe it was Richard Dawkins, but I could be wrong. It was a prominent, prominent atheist who once said that even if a 100-foot tall incarnation of Jesus appeared and told him, I am real, you should believe in me, he would be doubtful. He would still look for a natural explanation or perhaps it was a hallucination or something like that to explain it. He wouldn't, he, he would instinctively assume it's not true. And I, myself as a Christian, know that it would take a lot to convince me of atheism. So my question to both sides is, what would convince you specifically that Christianity is true or atheism is true? That's a fantastic question. I, I love this question. Um, so for myself, I'm, I'm probably not going to be uh, at the Richard Dawkins level of skepticism with that. Um, you know, I, I do understand that hallucinations are possible. There are lots of people who have seen God. But I mean, if I, you know, am able to go to the doctor or whatever, and like I, I know that like I'm mentally okay for the most part, and, and something happens where I, I encounter God or, or speak to God or whatever, I would be skeptical. But um, I, I think that such a thing could rationally overcome um, my, my skepticism in such an event. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think it's kind of like, what does that actually mean? Does that person exist? Um, and, and the answer might be yes, that person exists, but. All the details of theology, um, you know, whether or not now that, that Jesus still has a triune nature, um, Jesus may exist in, in some sort of form outside, um, you know, of death, um, historically, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he has a triune nature. Also, doesn't necessarily mean that he created the universe. Um, it just means that he's here, and that's interesting. What we could learn from that would be interesting, but we wouldn't follow up with a Christianity is completely true kitten caboodle. Um, and I think it's the same way, and you can figure that out by um, comparing it to Mormonism. Like, what would it take for Mormonism to be true, right? It's like, well, first of all, I'd need to know that, you know, maybe the golden plates were a thing, and, um, but, but like, even if the golden plates are a thing and Joseph Smith was right, that doesn't necessarily mean that the prophets now at the Mormon church are also correct in the prophecies that they give. Um, so you kind of have to take these things piece by piece. Religions, whole religions involve lots of moving parts, and, um, any one experience may help me understand one, and I'm totally open to that, but I would need um, every piece to kind of fall into place properly for me to form a coherent worldview about it. I was thinking about for me to uh, <clears throat> question the existence of God would be someone who would need to demonstrate to me that the law of non-contradiction does not hold and then be able to make an argument about that. As I stated earlier, that uh, if I myself exist, then something upon which I depend must exist. 
and I'm not speaking about this water or my mother or anything like that, you cannot have an infinite regress of effects without causes. If something happens out of nothing, you have nonsense. Nothing is no thing. And so for something to happen out of nothing, it would need to be and not be at the same time in the same relationship. So the great evidence that I have for the existence of God here tonight is the existence of my friends Josh and JJ. None of us can doubt the existence of God if, in fact, we are going to be rational in this world if we ourselves exist. You must throw out and jettison rationality if you're going to say that we exist without God. Same question on that? Yeah, you've still not given an account for morality. You've stated that human flourishing is something that should be desirable, but why is that so? This doesn't apply to me, because of my meta-ethics. I don't believe that there is an is-ought for morality in, in a second world. I don't think the universe imposes us to choose morality. Morality is just the term that describes actions that move towards that goal. That the goal is, you know, maximal well-being. I don't think I've ever once said flourishing on this stage yet. Um, except for just that. Well-being. Yeah, yeah. But I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I, when we talk about actions that improve well-being, when I do talk about morality, those that's that's what I'm describing. I have a definition, it's a thing. Like he did something very nice for the community around him. That was a very moral thing. It proved well-being. So I can describe something and measure it and say that was very moral, you know, more of this than you know a harmful thing. So there is a measurable a degree of difference there. I don't believe that the universe imposes it on us. I don't think that we have to be moral. I think that there are real consequences for people who are immoral. You get an incredible amount of suffering. And we have biochemically evolved reasons to avoid suffering. And so since we have evolved reasons to avoid suffering and want an improvement, morality is that, is that definition that seeks to best do that and use measurable standards. It's nothing more than that. It's just a way to measure whether or not you're increasing well-being. It does, my, my definition of morality does not tell you that you have to be moral. But the way, by what standard does it matter, though, that you seek well-being? Does it, it matter? Is, as far as the universe is concerned, there isn't one. Does it to you? No. I, I don't think that it's, it's prescriptive or universal. I think... No, I was asking you, does it matter for you? Mm -hmm. For me, I like improving the well-being. I, I but find why satisfied. does it matter? I find satisfaction in it, and so I am encouraged to continue doing it. So you find meaning in it? Uh, I'll stick with satisfaction. We can call it meaning, but I, th I think that we're just using these terms kind of colloquially. So what if somebody finds satisfaction in something that is off base? Is that then perfectly fine for them to do? No, that does not meet my definition of morality. It's just something that they did. And they can still do it, and they may still find satisfaction in it. But you stated why it matters is that you find satisfaction in it. That's why I choose to be moral. It doesn't matter, matter. I just, I've said many times, the universe doesn't impose this. You can choose it or you cannot choose it. Let's okay. go ahead and move on to the gentleman in the red there. Got a question? Uh, you mentioned what morality of measure, you know, this is more, he did this, so it's more nice or something. <coughs> measure. Well, by definition, when you say measure, because probably the most common thing we use for measuring is a tape measure. You know, okay. right? you, know you measure something. We have a definite, this this is an inch. That Universally, that is an inch. There's a standard. It, it is what it is. Okay. Some guy can't say, well, an inch is actually this long. Well, no, we have a standard for that inch. So when you say measure, you're assuming that there's a standard there. But but that standard is coming from, is 
that, what, what is that? I guess it kind of tags on a little bit of that, but kind of more so with the word measure when you say that. Right. It's like, how, how do you determine degrees in that sense? Like, is there a standard? I don't think that, I think it's like the tape measure example, that standard is a normative standard that we have agreed to as, you know, a society. This group of people is going to use this arbitrary degree of measurement for the standard. But even without the numbering system, there's still going to be a difference between this foreign ruler and this foreign ruler. And I think that if we wanted to as a society, and it may still, it, some people are working on this, you know, they've started to like, with psychological quizzes, you know, trying to rate how people feel pain or how you feel, rate of one in 10. And they build these things, and that's how we were, can develop better degrees of measurement for this. But I don't think that it's unmeasurable because we don't have a normative degree already. We have different standards of measurement too. Uh, metric versus English. Actually, it's humans that we don't. Say again? Actually, it's humans we don't. Okay. All humans believe that, uh, and every law and every society that survives believes that existence is special and it should be protected. Every one of our yeah, laws there's some, that. Yeah, absolutely. There's common, common themes on that. Yeah. Yes. Although, and, and there are significant differences too, and sometimes it's really difficult yeah. to figure it out. So, some don't have concepts of ownership and things like that. I have a question. Yeah, so uh, for the Christian, I was wondering, um, so uh, an argument that's kept coming up a bunch is uh, causality and stuff. And so why do you believe in a Christian God as opposed to just say like a deistic God? Um, well, as Josh pointed out, and I, uh, Josh's argument that he gave at the beginning is very arcane and <laughs> difficult to understand. Um, but uh, one of the things that he argued for real relationality, and, and he mentioned uh, the God of Allah, uh, which is a, a monad or a strict unity, um, cannot be real because, um, so I'm just saying, even, even from natural revelation, without even appealing to the scriptures right now, if it is true that God is all sufficient and the perfection of all that he is, then he must, within himself, without dependent upon his creatures, have that attribute of relationality. Um, for, for, the, for the Muslim, they don't know any concept of the love of God. They, 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 God is completely capricious and arbitrary, um, and that's kind of consistent with what they believe, because love is not something that is uh, uh, necessarily a part of his character. But the problem is, if it's not necessarily a part of his character, uh, then he's lacking something. If there is such a thing as relationality, like you and I are relating right now, if God is not relational in himself as he is apart from creation, then there is no relationship, there is no relationality. But since there is relationality, we know that there must be uh, a, a, a personal or subsistent relationship within that one being of, uh, of God. So uh, I'm appealing to that even, even without even appealing to the scriptures. Uh, I can say something like that. Again, these are these are arguments that philosophy came up with. Even, even uh, the Priest of Cracks uh, uh, argued uh, many of these things, and, and, and Plato, Plotinus, uh, uh, and so so I can even make this argument uh, from uh, uh, just thinking about things as I relate to uh, uh, this world. William Blue. All right. So I'm going to make an assumption here and assume that. All of you up there would agree that things that have happened in the past in the name of God, for example, the Spanish Inquisition, etc., were awful, sinful, in your perspective, things that we wouldn't want done in the name of God. So, but you earlier made the argument that people's sin kind of drew them to idolatry and viewing these other gods as the right god. Why would this God that wants us to follow him, why would he allow things like this to be done in his name rather than kind of making these people put this off on one of these idols, one of these other gods? So your question is, just a quick way, is why would God... Uh, are you, are you referencing like the Old Testament? Like why would God do certain things in the Old Testament or allow certain No, I'm talking about things that people have done in the name of God in fairly recent history. 
Why would you allow that to happen? Okay. Um, that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think that uh, you know when you're when you're talking about when you're talking about something like idolatry, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you're talking about distortions. Fundamentally, what idolatry is is a distortion of religion, it's a distortion of God, it's a misplaced sense of who God is, a misplaced sense of worship. Um, it's a, uh, a a misallocation of piety, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it, however you want to exposit uh, the notion of idolatry. It comes down to the notion of either wanting to, you know, bring bring God down to us and make it more comprehensible to us, and, and kind of become God in and of ourselves at that point for ourselves, uh, or or you know, it just it, it involves you know changing God in some way so that He can be more uh, uh, you know more preferable or something of that nature. So. I think with the, with the uh, Spanish, things like the Spanish Inquisition, when they say, well, we're doing this in the name of God, in the name of the Christian God, it can be demonstrated that what they did was was in, in, inconsistent with what God says about His church and about the mission of the church, the goal of the church, in places like Matthew 20. Uh, but, you know, I... In the, initially, that's where I would go. I think that their actions are inconsistent with who they say they are. So it would be like someone saying, um, "Be like someone saying, I'm a member of the FBI, but really they're, you know, an employee at Costco or something like that." Um, you know, people can say they say things, but because of sin, it's distorted. Uh, it's not true, and and that's dem demonstrable. I mean, I can demonstrate why the Spanish Inquisition is wrong in places uh, like the New Testament where Jesus gives the greatest commandments to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, just just the fact of the Spanish Inquisition is inconsistent with that little bit of data in the New Testament. I can show you other places as well. Um, that doesn't answer my question. The okay. question wasn't, is it wrong? The question was, why would he, if he's omniscient, if he's all-powerful, why would he allow his name to be attached to this. I would like to respond to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sin is real in the Christian in, in the Christian position. Um, sin is real. People act on it, um, and and we see in the Book of Job, for example, of how God uses sin to bring about His greater glory. Uh, Satan meant it for evil. God meant it for good in Genesis with Joseph and his brothers. So, is there a purpose in people's sinful acts? Yes. Uh, does that justify their acts? No. Um, because God still condemns them as something that's against his nature. Yet, he still uses what they do in order to bring about his greater glory. Which is actually, in Job, you see a microcosm of what actually happens when he does that. And what happens is Satan ends up being humiliated. Uh, Job is restored. And, uh, and, and God is vindicated uh, at the end of Job. And so in, in the mega theme of Scripture, when you see the end of redemption, it is something more glorious that we can even fathom that God is bringing about, even though there's suffering, He's working something through that. So even in the, in the case of the Spanish Inquisition, there are things that you know, were brought about after that, or there's, there's ways God is using that. We may not even know what those are right now, uh, but there's ways God's using that in order to bring about His greater glory, um, and uh, that still doesn't justify what they've been at the same time. So, go ahead. No, I mean, I think what you're saying like, makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, we, in our society, we have figured out that, you know, people pose as police officers and write their own speeding tickets, you know, or um, basically try to pretend to be somebody that they're not in order to like exercise their authority on something like that. We as a society realize that's bad, right? So we make that illegal and we punish those people and try to stop that from happening. God apparently hasn't figured that out, that that's, that's not a good thing, his message. Um, because he continues to let it happen over and over and over again, if, if it is that he exists. And um, the answer, again, that we're given is it's for his glory, just for his glory bad, if it's glory for his good. If it's good, it's for his glory. Um, yeah, and that, at, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, I just don't, I don't understand how, how that relates, how, how that's good. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Fine, Joe. Okay. And we have time for one more question. This is kind of talked about. So, go type Josh. I can quote you saying, I'm used to that. <laughs> I can quote you saying, God hates the wicked and that God is not all loving. So, wouldn't, if that is true, wouldn't that make the Spanish Inquisition consistent with God's will? I was just quoting scripture when I said that. Uh, no. Um, why I would ask why that would make it inconsistent. Well, I would I would say if God hates the wicked, and if the Spanish Inquisition was being taken on God's example of who the wicked are, wouldn't that wouldn't that create a consistency between what happened? Well, if God is judge, doesn't He have the prerogative to administer the judgment how He wishes? Right. I mean, from the Christian perspective, that's how we would answer that. I mean, it's God's prerogative to judge ultimately, and so when when you see people taking God's justice or God's uh, mission into their own hands without justifying it properly, so why uh, do you go on mission trips to do good? Because we're commanded to, and in, in, at the end of Matthew, Jesus tells us to go and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So. Well, I mean. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. You know, why why do we go and evangelize? Um, God has ordained a means. I don't mean evangelize. I mean specific mission trips that are just doing good. Is that is the sole purpose of that to evangelize? Well, you get into the whole philosophy of missions. I, 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 you know, I differentiate from some. I, I don't think that we should ever make a mission trip about you know uh, social welfare or something like that. I think it needs to always be centered around the gospel and gospel proclamation. Um, if you want to go out and build a house for someone and improve their lives, that's fine, but do it because uh, you want to build relationships to communicate the gospel because you care about their eternal salvation. All right, I think that's a good place to leave it out. Um, I want to thank Vijay Panthrone, Joshua Stewart, Josh Summer, and Trey Jadlow, and Emmanuel about this church for giving us the space to let this happen. I want to thank you guys for coming out. Um, that's it. I think we've settled this up.